We welcome you all tonight. Glad that you're here with us so we can fellowship in the truth. The love of the truth knits us with God and it knits us with one another also. Amen. Welcome those of you who are with us on live stream also. We dearly appreciate your fellowship. Tonight will be our 46th exposition of the book of Amos. We're going to be in the 8th chapter, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> Some people are of the persuasion that there's no benefit or a little benefit of the most in the writing of Moses and the prophets. That, of course, is why they're so neglected. Whether they know it or not, people that maintain a lack of familiarity with Moses and the prophets have demonstrated beyond all controversy that they don't believe they're profitable. That's the way it is. And some people are even bold enough to talk about the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. And still others of this unlearned and ignorant assembly affirm that the entirety of the writings of Moses and prophets have been swept away being nailed to the cross. I come from such a background. That, that's, it sounds like it's foolish that that is taught. Yeah. I was taught that in a, a mild form of it. Some members of the same movement I was in teach it dogmatically. If you don't know they do, you just need to be acquainted with things. <laughs> You need to be acquainted. This, these conditions do exist. So as a result, as a whole, the contemporary church is, is fundamentally ignorant of Moses and the prophets. That's the, that's the offshoot of it all. And this has opened uh, the door to s some increased satanic activity. It would be confusing, if I believe that, it would be confusing to believe something like that and then to have God sanctioning the writing and maintenance of the books he obviated to continue in circulation for the last 2,000 years. I mean, I, some people are like the ostrich. God's deprived him of wisdom. A person should be... Even if a person didn't know the truth, they should be able to think this thing out. That if God's overall, God would not allow a needless word to continue to be represent his name in the world. And why would God make an end to the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? Yeah, that's right. What kind of reasoning would... Uh, why would he say all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable if it's not? So we're on good ground and we talk about it when you probe into this. We're on good ground. There's one uh, underlying truth that casts all of these foolish speculations down to the ground. <clears throat> and it's this. I am the Lord, I change not. See, he who is everlasting is not subject to change because change is an aspect of mortality. Yeah. Only what decays changes, and the change is generally downward. God doesn't change. Amen. He is an everlasting God and an eternal God. That's why the Spirit could say it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. as the same God that Adam yes. confronted. He can say that, make that statement because God is unchanging. If God was changeable, it would be unwarranted to make a statement like that. You'd have to say, well, which God are you talking about? And there's only one God. 
This is confirmed in the writings of the apostles. Whenever traits surfaced that God did not approve, they dealt with them. They didn't let them stay. Rather, they didn't let them stay because they knew God's unchangeable. So when it, there was fornication at Corinth, they didn't, the church at Corinth didn't do anything about it, but Paul didn't bury it and pretend like it didn't exist and say, you knew how we all are. He did something about it. When the church at Corinth was sloppy at the Lord's table, Paul didn't let this pass. Why? He knew God was an unchanging God. He knew God will not countenance people that, that do not remember his son properly. He will not gloss it. He will not gloss it. Not after what he sent Jesus to do. He will not allow people to ignore it. They will not get by with it. That's why these apostles brought these things up, you see. And they spoke clearly to them. Jesus, when he saw faults in the churches of Asia, hey, he didn't pass them by. Some churches had the fault that just somebody in the congregation believed some ho hocus pocus. Somebody in their church wasn't a leader, but they held to the doctrine of Nicolaitans, and Jesus brought it up. He said, I hate those things they believe. Don't think for one moment he isn't the same. See, I'm establishing a point here that when we read about God's reaction to sin, no matter if it's in the Garden of Eden or whether it's the children of Israel or whether it's Herod or whether it's the early church, wherever it is, it's got to be confronted. Now, it may ruin someone's career, but that, so what? It, what does that make any difference? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living yeah, God. Yeah. It really is because he's unchanging. Amen. That's what we've got to learn from this book of Amos. See? God's long-suffering has a terminal point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, there are some in our fair city... There are some that teach God's long-suffering is everlasting. Uh -huh, yeah. It's a doctrine that's taught. I don't know what you do with the flood. What do, exactly what do you do with the flood? Yeah. The long-suffering of God waited, it says. Uh -huh. It quit waiting after 120 years. That was it. That's right. And it wasn't waiting for the sinners. It was waiting for a, 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 nowhere to finish the ark. Amen. God's long-suffering has a terminal point. His mercy can be exhausted. Yes. Sodom and Gomorrah were tolerated for a long time, then they weren't. So it's imperative that we uh, be familiar with these things. That surely isn't too hard for anybody. If it is, well, you just have to swallow it anyway. <laughs> It's just the way it is. Now, our text tonight is Amos uh, 8, verses 7 and 8. The Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. <clears throat> Maybe I'll read that again. Surely I will never forget any of their works. Amen. Shall not the land tremble for this, and everyone mourn that dwelleth therein? It shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. <clears throat> Just the language itself makes you want to understand what he's talking about. Just the way he, the way he speaks. You know that this is, this is not something I want to gloss over. The Lord is sworn by the excellency of Jacob. <clears throat> now the words that are going to follow this are to speaking what underlined in capital letters are to writing. It's a point of emphasis. <coughs> the spiritual dullness of Israel had been continued 
for so long that they were beyond the point of anything being done about it. Yeah, yeah some people don't think such a point exists, but it, they, reached, they had reached it. This fearful condition expressed other, was expressed by other prophets of God's people getting to a point where nothing could be done about it. I said, where nothing could be done about it. Nothing could be done about it. You let, it let it burn into your soul. Nothing could be done about it. Here's the word from 2 Chronicles 36, 16. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of God rose against the people till, 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 there was no remedy. Hmm. Through Jeremiah, <clears throat> the Lord said, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon your altars. What do you mean? This is something that can't be erased. You can no more erase these sins now than you could erase the Ten Commandments and tables of stone. Uh -huh. Is what he's talking about here. Say, what, what is that? Well, the important thing is not what is that. Mm -hmm. The important thing is to avoid that. Yeah. Whatever you have to do to remain sensitive to God, do it. Yeah. Amen. You can't afford to be insensitive to God. That is a downward spiral that has no bottom. Amen. That's what happened to Israel. They despised his prophecy. Yes. Got to the point they were insensitive to God. Yeah. Maybe you've seen it happen. Jesus said, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but... The blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men, and whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this world, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Amen. People get all caught up with, what is it? What is the sin? What is it? He didn't tell you what it was. He doesn't want you to know what it is. He wants you to live close enough to God that it'll never happen. Amen. That's the point. Yeah. The point isn't what is the sin that can't be forgiven. That's not the point. Yeah. The point is live in such a manner that you are continually cleansed from all unrighteousness. Amen. That's the point. Amen. Yes, amen. You don't get drawn off into these academic pit holes and yeah. whirlpools. John writes, there's a sin unto death. I do not say that you should pray for it. See, there's some sins. To... Prayer doesn't do any good. You say, well, what are they? Well, he doesn't spell out what they are. He expects the people of God to wake up. Yeah. Well, you don't have to deal with things like this. Sometimes I think it looks like the sin has been committed, but the truth of the matter is I'm not sure. I don't know. But God does. Yeah. God's, God's ears are closed to some prayers. Uh -huh. don't even, there's some things, don't, don't even pray for it. If you don't know what it is, you pray, it just shoot, goes up into the air, that's all. Nothing happens about it. point I'm making there is that God can be pushed to a point where nothing can be done about your situation. We don't want that for anybody. You've got to be so serious about this, you are not going to allow yourself, by the grace of God, to get in that kind of situation. You've got all the grace that's necessary now to keep out of it. you got intercessor in heaven to help you keep out of it. you got intercessor within you to be keep out of it. You've got the grace of God that teaches you to keep out of it. You've got your faith that will keep you out of it. you got your love of the truth that will help you out of it. See, you got too much going for you. Get in that kind of condition. So we see someone fall away. <laughs> it's not innocent. Yeah, amen. 
Amen. People who fall away have quenched the spirit and grieved the spirit and stifled the spirit and ignored the word and forgot God and didn't think about death and didn't think about judgment and didn't think about Jesus. He yeah, just didn't fall away accidentally. Thank God all this is in God's hands. I would hate to have to be charged with identifying who's on this side of the line, who's on that side. It's that man make a mistake now trying to apply an academic definition to texts like this. You've got to take him this way. I, Lord, keep me back. This is what David said. Keep me back from presumptuous sins. Yeah. Lest I commit the great transgression. Uh -huh. yeah. Say, what's the great transgression? That's not even the right question to ask. That's a foolish question to ask. God knows what it is. That's why David asked him to keep him from the great transgression. You stay close enough to God and sensitive enough to God and tender enough to God that this kind of thing can't happen. That's the point. <clears throat> That's right. <laughs> he sure did. Remember, I, we start out by saying God's long suffering has a termination point. Those texts talk about it. Now the text says, The Lord, the Lord has sworn. Not the Bible says, The Lord. <laughs> There's a difference. There's a difference in that approach. The Bible says, The Lord has said. Because it's in the Bible. I understand that. But until the Bible is seen as the Lord has said, it, it's just a book. Right. This phrase, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, occurs 6,918 times in Scripture. So we ought to be, <laughs> we ought to be familiar familiar with it, they mean there's really only one Lord, the, there's really only one Lord. And this is the Lord of Lords. He's the Lord of all the earth, He's the Lord of hosts, the God of gods, the Lord of heaven. They are a key expression that calls us, the Lord, did the Lord say that? Perk up. Let your soul stand at attention. If, if this is the Lord who's over all the earth, who's the Lord of lords, so if this is who said it, then I'm going to pay attention to it. Men may not be able to speak to God, but God sure can speak to men. The Lord has sworn, other versions say, taken an oath, confirms an oath, swears an oath, made a promise. Now, there's a lot of very uh, naive teaching about oaths that are given by men that they really shouldn't be teaching. They say men should never take oaths. They should never take them pointlessly like the Pharisees did. But Jesus took oaths. God took oaths. Don't you dare tell me I'm not to take an oath. Oaths, he's sworn. He's got manner. In mankind, among mankind, oaths are to underwrite what has been said. An oath is the end of all controversy, Hebrews says. If, we, if a fellow makes an oath and swears to hold by it, that's a that's the end of all controversy. So that's what an oath is. An oath, God doesn't have to take oaths. God's word can't fail, but he takes an oath for our sakes yes, that we which have fled to him to a refuge for refuge to lay hold of the hope, say before him that we might have confidence. Mm -hmm. So he takes an oath, say, surely. <laughs> this is what I'm going to, God doesn't have to say surely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's how it has to be said to us because we are very lacking in our perception of God at the very best. Mm -hmm. We've just seen the border of the garment of his glory. So he took, took an oath. Now saying, saying, I have sworn, that's the equivalent to what he said previously when he said, uh, I will not turn away the punishment. 
That's what he told Israel. You've sinned three, yet four transgressions. I will not turn away from the punishment. That's equivalent to I swear. I swear. It's his nature. With God, it's his nature that moves him to swear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Swear an oath. And swearing becomes an obligation to the person who swears it's an obligation. Mm -hmm. But it's not an obligation with God. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's his nature yes. Amen. That's right. to swear, mm -hmm. confirm it with an oath. Mm -hmm. Because men are weak, they have to take an oath. Mm -hmm. Because God is strong, that's why he takes an oath. See, it's all difference in the world. <laughs> The Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob. Now our translating friends really come through on this. They threw some wells, dirt and rocks in the wells. Sometimes I read some of these versions. It's a miracle anybody can know what to do. Here are some of the translations of this. Uh, I have sworn by the excellency of Jacob. Sworn by the pride of Jacob by Jacob's pride, by the glory of Jacob, against the pride of Jacob, by the arrogance of Jacob, by his own name, God's own name, the pride of Israel. The pride of Israel is sworn, though you take great pride in your ancestor Jacob. <laughs> How's that? And he used his name, pride of Jacob. So there's three possible meanings there. God is swearing by the arrogance of Jacob because they're prideful. God is swearing because Israel has pride in its ancestor, Jacob. And God is swearing by his own name, the pride of Jacob, which happens to be one of his names. As those of you that are familiar with Scripture know, the word translated pride, Hosea 5.5 5 and Hosea 7.10 call God the pride of Israel. The word translated excellency is used in a variety of ways depending on the context used. But here, as used here, it means exaltation, majesty, excellence. The point of the term is that God is the one in whom Israel should have been glorying. He's the only one deserving of glory. He is the pride of Israel. Now God has sworn, I want to make a point here, God has sworn by His holiness, as Psalm 89, 35. God has sworn by His right hand, that's Psalm 62, 8. God has sworn by His great name, Jeremiah 44, 26. God has sworn by himself, Amos 6, 8. Once it is written, I have sworn by my wrath. <clears throat> See, he swears, God never swears by anything but himself. Yeah, yeah, amen. He does not swear because of the arrogance of Israel. That's not enough to move him to swear. He can only be moved to swear by himself. God is not moved to swear by you. He's moved to swear. By himself. <clears throat> God alone possesses traits worthy of praise and exaltation, and Israel, instead of vaunting or putting up, pushing up to the front their own desires, they should have been glorying in the Lord, who was the, quote, the pride yes, of Israel. <clears throat> When he said I was, he was provoked, the Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, he has not been provoked by something good that he's seen. Mm -hmm. He's been provoked by something Hello. contrary to the divine nature. Hello. Hello. There is a kind of conduct that awakens a side of God you don't want awakened. 
God is the God of mercy. God is the God of love. God is the God of truth. But God is the God of wrath. He's that too. And there are certain circumstances that awaken his wrath. And whatever you've got to do to keep that kind of thing from erupting in your life, do it. You don't want there to be something in you that prompts Jesus to say, I've got something against you. You don't, you don't want that. It ought to be noted that the church is in a similar situation as Israel. The only legitimate glory they can have is in the Lord. That's why it's written, if any man glory, let him glory in the Lord. It's twice written to the churches. If any man glory, now I've been to a lot of uh, church conventions and missionary conventions that are really uh, overstated. But I very rarely, over the past 60 plus years, I very rarely heard anyone glory in the Lord. It's generally been something else. If any man glory, even if it's at a convention, let him glory in the Lord. <coughs> Why is this so? If any man glory, let him glory in the Lord. Because if there is something of worth before God that's found in you, it's God that worked it in you. Amen. Right. Both the will and do of his own good pleasure. That's why you glory in the Lord. That's right. If there is something, mm -hmm. to other people it may appear as though this was your product. Well, in a sense, you, you were in it, your heart was in it, but it was God that actually yeah. did it. So we glory in the Lord. Mm -hmm. I've sworn by the excellency, by the excellency of who I am mm -hmm. and the position I hold I've sworn. Here's what I've. What do you swear? What did you swear, Lord? I'll never forget your works. Yeah. That makes me shake. Yeah. I don't want him ever to say that to me. Yeah. I'm never going to forget your what you've done. I'm never. Is there anyone like that? Oh, yes, there's people like that. Amen. Cain, he never did forget. Yeah, right. He read it written in Scripture. Amen. What he did. Hmm. Balaam, he had it written in Scripture. Mm -hmm. there's Judas, he had it written in Scripture. Mm -hmm. There's people God never did forget what they did. They, 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 put, they went that far. Mm -hmm. They went that far, and the last thing you know about them was bad. I will never forget you. He's not talking about their good works because he's already give, delivered a severe diatribe against them because of what they've done. So he's not talking about you've done a lot of good works and I'm not going to forget them. If you have, God's not unrighteous to forget your labor of love and work of faith. He doesn't forget the works of people that love him and serve him. But that's not the kind of works he's talking about here. I'll never forget your works. Now, we're being exposed to how a God that is provoked speaks. I remember Paul said, do you provoke the Lord? Are we stronger than he? See, but here's how a God that's provoked speaks. First Kings 14.22 says, Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, and they co which they committed above all he f their fathers had done. They provoked him. And again, in the Psalm seventy-eight fifty-eight, they provoked him to anger with their high places, and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. Psalm 106, 29. And again, they, they provoked him to anger with their inventions. Psalm 106, 43. They provoked him with their counsel. 
Jeremiah 8, 19, why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images and strange vanities? You can push, you can push God, you can aggravate him. You don't want to do it. This is, this is possible. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? No, <laughs> no, we're not. So now let's see what uh, provoke God says. Surely, surely, truly or certainly or indeed. This is a word that denotes divine determination. This is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to change my mind on this. It's what's going to happen. Surely. God said to Adam, said to Adam, if you eat, you eat this fruit, you'll surely, you'll surely die. The promise concerning Abraham was prefaced by this word, Abraham shall surely become a great nation. Joseph was convinced of this divine trait when he gave commandment concerning his bones. He said, God will surely visit you and carry my bones out. The psalmist said, surely, goodness and mercy. See, this, is, this can only be said of God, surely, mm -hmm. yeah. surely because of who he is. This is something that must become integral to man's thinking. There is a surely yeah, factor when you're dealing with God. If, it's, if it has to do with iniquity, there's a surely connected yes. with it. Yeah. If it has to do with righteousness, there's a surely yes. connected with it. Amen. Surely, surely, I will, I will. Mm -hmm. I will. It speaks of God's motivation. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, God always does what he wills to do. Amen. He's the only person who can always do what he wants to do, and that's what he does. Yep. He never does what he doesn't want to do, even though some people think that's the case. They say, for instance, God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, and they conclude, well, the fact that some are not going to be saved means that's, that God wanted them to be saved, but they weren't. But see, that's, that's not exactly what that text means. It means, well, he's made provision for all to be saved. But one part of his character is he that believes not shall be damned. And God has a want there too. Yes. I will. In Daniel's day it was declared of God. He doeth according to his will. In the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. His will. See what? God's will doesn't always mean his commandments for you. See, this, here's some declaration of God's will. Having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. That's, that's what he wanted to do. That's what he did. The fact that you wanted to be saved was not the determining factor. Yeah, amen. The determining factor is when God wanted to save you. And when you received his son, mm -hmm. he wanted to save you. Again, it is written, In whom also ye have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. No wonder Jesus taught us to pray, Thy will be done on earth. Thy will be, thy will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. So what is now expressed is the will of God. I will. This is the will of God. This isn't God being backed up in the corner and forced to do something he doesn't want to do. It's not what he's saying. I will never. Most versions read, I will never. Most all of the 48 versions I've it said, I will never. Yes point of I will thought the equivalent of saying I will is when Jesus said of a truth I say unto you that poor widow hath cast in more than they all or 
He said many times, verily I say unto you, it means truly. It means this is going to happen. This is a superlative. If not, this might happen if all goes well, if the circumstances allow, yeah. because God makes the circumstance. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it's not, there's no ifs involved. There's no might or maybe. That's right. I will, and nothing's going to stop him. Amen. Mm -hmm. If a person believes, God tells you what he'll do. If a person doesn't believe, God tells you what he's going to do. This is good to know. This. Just Amen. have it that cut and dried. Yeah. That's like when you confess your sins. You know, he's already, he's already made right. a commitment. That's right. Never, never. Nothing on earth can change this determination. Never, never. Word means no circumstance on earth can change it. God expressed several things he said to the Israel. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Because yeah. Jesus alluded to this when he said, The poor you have always with you. He was referring, he was referring to that, that statement. Again, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never, mm -hmm. never thirst. They, of those that believe on Christ Jesus said they shall never, never perish. Paul wrote of those who are ever learning and never, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, there's some people, they learn a lot, but they can't come to the knowledge of the truth. God has promised a faith lie will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So when you read that word never, you know this is like chiseled in stone here. The only way this can change is for the thing that preceded it to change. The varying factor is not the promise. It's the one, it's the person who is subject to the promise. That's the person that the, is variable, not, not the promise. And sometimes it's, it's not as easy as some people think to lay hold of this word. The devil has a way of throwing darts of doubt in people's minds, but you've got to Fasten on what God said. If he said, he that believeth shall never perish. You've know, you got to fasten on that yeah, and yeah. believe with all your soul because that's the truth. That's right. The only way to perish is not belief. Mm -hmm. So fight the good fight of faith, brethren, Amen. and hope. Surely I will never, I will never forget any of their works. Hmm. Anything they've done, any of their deeds. Now contrast that with the new covenant. Yeah. I will remember their sins no more. Amen. Look, look, <laughs> look what a difference. What's the difference? Is it the people? Is that the difference? Yes, that Jesus took sin away. That's the difference. That's right. The difference is God dealt with sin in Jesus Christ. He dealt with sin. And if a person will believe on Christ, come into Christ, he gets all the benefits of having their sins remembered yes. no more at all. Amen. Yeah. That's the way it is. But under the law, <laughs> that's not the way it was. When he says, um, I'll, I will never forget their works, that means they kept on piling up. They kept on accumulating. Kept on accumulating until finally they get so massive they bury the person in hopelessness. I don't think a lot of people know this, but sin does that. Until you come into Christ, sin keeps accumulating personal transgression. And the more it accumulates, the stronger its hold is upon the person. The only reason there's any exception to this is because of the work of Christ. This is why also in Christ there's continual cleansing. Now, you know 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 7 speaks, if we walk in the light, and I'm talking about confession here. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Amen. That's right. That's the new covenant equivalent to sins of ignorance. Well, you, you live by faith, the Lord will keep you clean. Yes, 
When you see something, you confess it. Yes. Why is it that way? Because the, prayer, the blessing of God is contingent upon cleanliness. Yes, amen. It's contingent upon sin not being dominant and sin being forgiven. So God has made full provision for this. Yes. If it's a, a, you don't have an awareness of it, the Holy Spirit within intercedes in words that cannot be uttered addresses the situation. Jesus intercedes for heaven, addressing the situation, because God's not going to take unclean people to heaven. Amen. He's not going to do it. Right. So he, because he, he, can't, he can't do it without violating his nature. Yeah. And so he makes provision for his cleanliness. So for God to say, I'll never forget their works, that was... You don't ever want to hear words like that. Whole generation is written off. We've talked yeah. about this before, but there's yeah. been whole generations that have just been yeah. written off, and anyone that was saved was the exception to the rule. And, it, and he adds, shall not the land... Really yes. Before you move on from that, I was considering these sins of ignorance, and sometimes the phrase, the way people talk about them, it may look like there is admittance because there is ignorance. You don't realize, but that's not a state that will continue. Yeah, that's right. You uh -huh. mentioned this fellowship. As we continue to be in fellowship, we yeah. grow mm -hmm. both in our understanding and our sensitivity towards sin. That's right. And so there is going to become coming a time when these sin, mm -hmm. sins of ignorance we won't be ignorant of them anymore. Amen. The Lord will bring these things to light. Amen. And that's when we can confess and be purged from them. Yes, amen. Yeah, you know, a person maybe who is unlearned may wonder, what, what do you mean when you say sensitive to God? What You find it easy to think about God as he's represented in Scripture. You're alert. You really want to do God's will. You are, you're alert to that. So that if you read something, you hear something, it informs you maybe of something you didn't know about, immediately respond. That's what we're talking about, sensitivity. This isn't just like an emotion. Right. It's not that. It's that there's an overriding and dominating concern in you to be right with God. Mm -hmm. This has got hold of you. That's being sensitive. As long as you're in that state, God will take care of you. Yeah. If these sins that Sister Barbara mentioned are there, he'll, he'll bring you to where you can see them. And, just, and it, until then, he'll he'll keep you clean until you kind of see this, see these things. But you know, and this is why it's such a tragedy to be in an assembly that never talks about these kinds of things, because you'll you still have these kinds of things, but they won't be resolved. You you'll never come to where yeah. you 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 yeah. you're strong enough to be able to 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 see it. I. I, I See, some people offer another resolution. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. They say it's a good, it's a really good system. It really works. There's been a lot of people just give a line. We've got a line of people testifying how this system works. But uh, you don't want anything to do with a system Jesus didn't originate. Amen. That's right. And there are not many systems he originated. <laughs> <laughs> a system generally means it runs by itself, you know. Now God had uh, the people who continued stubbornly in sin, they continue. He said, Shall not the land tremble for this, and everyone mourn that dwelleth therein, and it shall rise up holy as a flood, it shall cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. That means when this comes, no one's going to be able to withstand it. It's going to be absolute desolation. Now the certainty of divine judgment is now declared by Amos. But the people have stubbornly resisted God in spite of the fact that the law was given. When the law was given, many wonderful promises for good were given. I'll give you some examples. Right up front he told them, if you do this, I'll do that. And the law, when the law was given at Sinai, there were people were warned about the results of disobedience, and the curses were a lot more than the blessings were. Spelled out pretty clearly. Then there were frequent chastenings. See, 
And then God sent prophets frequently and early to stem the tide of sin, warn the people concerning it. So there's at least four things that God had done to take away any excuse for sin. God himself brought their attention to the whole situation. He said to Jeremiah, or through Isaiah, what could have been done more for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Now, let's say that there's a person that is a drunkard. And uh, they make a profession to be a Christian also. And so, so far as they're concerned, they're a, a Christian, and they love God with all their heart, but they have this, this problem of getting drunk. And it would be appropriate to say, now wait, wait a minute. What could God have done more to keep you from being a drunk? As a matter of fact, I think questions like that ought to be asked. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't think you're as innocent in this as you're letting on. What could God have done more? What could God have done to keep you out of this? And the question is, God couldn't have done any more right. than what he's done. The truth of the matter is, anyone under the dominion of sin can get out from under it when they want to. Yeah. Amen. It's, just, it's just, that, yes. just that simple. Now the time of reckoning has come for Israel. Shall not the land tremble for this? For this, what? This iniquity you can... That I'm rebuking you for it. Shall not the land tremble for this, this judgment that's coming? Other versions say, Because of this will not the land quake. Shall not the land tremble in its account and be troubled. This was the prophecy of an apocal earthquake that was going to happen because of this. In fact, when Amos begins his book, he refers to this earthquake that happened two years after the writing of this book. Here's what he said, Amos 1.1. 1, 1. The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa when he saw concerning Israel in the, days, in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Yeah. And Zechariah refers to the same earthquake. Here's what he said. Ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, see? Mm -hmm. king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints shall flee with thee. So this is, uh, that's all we know about this earthquake. These two, er, the earthquake. Yeah. Well, it must have been, must have been an epochal earthquake. Yeah. The earthquake. And God said, won't the earth tremble? You know, he talk, talk about the time when I will shake all things. Well, this time he just sh shook the, the land of Israel with the great earthquake. The earthquake. This case, the earthquake was a was a judgment, like with Korah and the rebels when the earth opened up and swallowed them, or Jonathan and his armor bearer when they confronted the Philistines. There was a localized earthquake during that occasion. Now, what has happened actually in this earthquake? He's like shook the people out of the land, yeah, like, uh -huh. like shaking the garment. And mm -hmm. Here's how uh, it's said in Leviticus 18. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger. This is Deut Deuteronomy 29. The Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. That's after the giving of the law, just before entering the Canaan. During the giving of the law, this was said. God's explaining to them why the nations that were occupying Canaan were going to be thrust out. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. 
to the land spew not you also out also when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. So what happened? The sin got so bad, the earth like vomited these people out. <laughs> the land trembles. Yes, that's what he's talking about here. They had to leave. Now sometimes in cases like this, the wicked weren't the only people carried away. You take in the days of the Babylonian captivity, and uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Mishael, and Azariah, they were innocent. They weren't sinners, but they were carried away by the flood, too. Hmm? Flood took them away, too. It shall rise up holy as a flood, as the flood of Egypt. Other versions read the whole land shall rise like the Nile. It shall be stirred up and then sink like the river Nile. Now we understand that this refers to the overflowing of the Nile that happened every year. Still does to this day. The waters overflow over a large region to, the, to 16 cubits deep. And that is what makes that f area fertile yeah. uh -huh. is the overflow. Yeah. No one can stop the river. It just it just rises, overflows, then subsides in due time. That's what this judgment's going to be like. It's suddenly going to rise like a flood, overflow, and recede back. God said about this judgment to, the, to Isaiah, it would be as the flood of mighty waters overflowing. See, it's suddenly, and men are helpless in a flood. Nobody can really contend with the flood. Yeah. They've got to try and escape or find some means of survival, but they can't mm -hmm. control a flood. Mm -hmm. That's what this <coughs> overflowing is going to be. This was a divine reaction to persistent sin. Yeah. Yeah. To persistent. Mm -hmm. Persistent. Mm -hmm. See, that's why we're always concerned when we find somebody, anybody, persisting. That's, now this is this has gone beyond mm -hmm. any norm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous. We probably know some people. You probably know some people who are persistently sinning. Yeah. It's dangerous. Dangerous situation. Sin is persisted in, continues and increases. This is another thing about sin. Sin is like leaven. It doesn't. It doesn't never remain localized. Mm -hmm. You can't localize sin. It expands. Yeah. There's a little sin in the church. Pretty soon the whole church is feeling contaminated yeah. by it. It increases in the end. And the, with the increase, there comes a certain dullness mm -hmm. that can't be avoided. You'll notice in your own, own life that there are some environments you'll be in some of them by choice and some because you that's just the way it is but these environments if you let them will dull your spiritual sensitivities mm -hmm. you may fall into a griping mode or something like that but whatever it it, it has a stultifying effect yeah. upon the soul and then as sin increases God's wrath increases see more sin, more indignation, pretty soon it's got to erupt. It's like a volcano. It's got to burst forth. And that's what we're reading about. We're reading about a time when Israel's sin got to the point where God's wrath could not be restrained anymore. Now where that lion is, I have no idea. It was some it was centuries before it happened. But wherever it is, your safety is to walk by faith, live in the Spirit, yes. fellowship with Christ, yes. fight the good fight of faith, and the guarantee is you will never cross that Amen. line. Because Amen. Mm -hmm. you'll triumph. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You'll never, you'll never provoke God if you walk by faith. Yes. Yes, Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? Today we were talking to
to a gentleman, a delivery man, and we went over this about that the death of Christ didn't change God. As it is properly taught that that yeah. God, this Christ's death has made God less sensitive to sin. When he looks at you, he doesn't even see the sin, even though it's there. And so I, I, we, we kind of, the man talked a little bit, and I sensed he had heard this. And I said, you know what Christ's death changed? It changes you, or you're not really in. You're not really in Christ if you still love to sin. And and I could tell he's, he sensed this, that he could yeah. see this. And But it, it was refreshing to go over this, because the death of Christ hasn't changed God. He hasn't changed one bit. And that's why we can have all this confidence that He's everything he's promised, yeah. he's going to do. And, and another thing about the flood, uh, I, I was edified by it. the flood. These floods, they nobody prepares for a flood. It's like, well, next week, you know, it's going to flood. No, you don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, you may sense, well, this is a flood region, but you don't know the day it's going to come. Same thing with this judgment. It's going to day when you think not. It's yeah. in a day when you're thinking, oh, God's not looking. It's going to come right then. Yeah. Yes. That point that you made of. God always doing what he wants was uh, provided a very stark contrast in my in my mind and you mentioned briefly how that people uh, very commonly uh, consider God as God not getting what he wants mm -hmm. and I think that's a that's a very dangerous subtlety mm -hmm. is is it possible that God not get what he wants or mm -hmm. not do what he wants. It seems, it seems like uh, this this is like intrinsic to being God. Is yeah. that he does he does yeah. what he wants. He's not he's not hindered. He's not he's not stopped. He's not refused. He's because it, this is God. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so this subtlety, I think, actually uh, robs people of of knowing. Knowing God, it seems too simple to say that, but but to, to receive the subtlety, to let to let that into your thinking, it makes it impossible to serve to serve God, to know to know God, if He doesn't in the end do what He wants. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's that's why I modified it by saying ultimately, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. right. because He expected. A harvest of good grapes from Israel. Yes. Mm -hmm. But he got bad ones. But see, that stirred up a want. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> he didn't look at it and say, I want to save them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he still, it, it moved what he wanted. Because yeah. mm -hmm. he has a certain reaction to evil just like he does to righteousness. Yeah. 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 That, er that error creates all kinds of other tributaries of, of yeah. error. Yeah, yeah, amen. It, it, it would, it would pray, it would, it would rob you of, of confidence. Like how, mm -hmm. how do you pray to a God that you're, you're actually convinced that He doesn't and can't always do what He wants? How does that affect your prayer? Yeah, <laughs> it, has, it has all kinds of, of effects yes. that I, I think are unknown and undetected to people mm -hmm. who, who would, who would think that way? And, and this is this is stated doctrinally. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. That's, so that's an express yes. statement of Scripture. So yes. we're not. This is not a conclusion we've drawn. This yes. is a yes. statement that's been made. He works yes. all things after the counsel of his own will. Yes. Amen. That's the doctrine of the free will of God. That's right. <laughs> See, your purpose isn't to try and get God to give you what you want. Yes. Your purpose is to ask God to give you what He wants. Yes, amen. Yes. And then that's what you, that you want what He wants uh -huh. you to have. Yes. Place yourself within the circumference of what He's revealed. That's right, what amen. He's doing for blessing. Stay away from the realm of cursing. Amen. This, what you were highlighting here about the, the earthquake and the flood. Made me think about some of the environmental catastrophes that have happened yeah. in our own generation or in this land yeah. uh, for many generations. Different times, both earthquakes, floods mm -hmm. of all kinds, cyclones, tornadoes, yeah. whirlwinds, everywhere, including in Joplin, Missouri. Yes. 
I, I was going to say something. I think I omitted saying it. That Israel acted unnaturally in not keeping the law. They 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 contradicted the moral. So nature acted contrary to nature's yeah. law. You see. Huh? To them. Uh, to the, to them. That's right. So the yeah. nature doesn't didn't normally operate like earthquakes and floods. That yeah. wasn't the norm. Yes. But when man doesn't live up to the norm, they shouldn't be surprised if nature doesn't either. Yeah. Well, in a, in a cursed earth, can you say that earthquakes and floods and cyclones and whirlwinds are not natural in a cursed earth? No, well, it's still it's God sends it. Yeah, mm -hmm. in yes. a sense. They happen in the natural world, but they can't. They happen at divine discretion still. Yeah. Well, that's why God said at the, at the near the end of the world, um, these, these natural disasters will happen in diverse places. Yes. Uh -huh. You're not expecting it to happen. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so you're going to understand it as man forsakes uh, God, God's going to forsake this earth. Yeah, this if if they just if they happened just because the world was cursed, then it seems to me they'd be be more frequent. They can happen because the world is cursed, but God is in Yeah, He directs it. But it's because it's been cursed that such that such things can happen at all. It's because the earth is under the under the curse. When all things were made good. That's right. There wasn't even a capacity for that. That's right. The, yeah. the earth had to be cursed before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Things to ponder. <laughs> Amen. Anyone else tonight? All right. Our Heavenly Father, we are uh, serious and eager about this to be well pleasing in your sight, to walk as dear children. We know that you have the grace for us to do this, and now we devote ourselves to be attentive and alert, and we ask for your assistance in this so we'll be able to be strong in the power of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.